A new setback for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Be on the lookout for a new cash payment from the government later this week. And a modern day Babe Ruth takes the field and the mound. Tuesday needs to know. Let's go. Good morning, this is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for Tuesday, July 13th. I'm Jill Wagner with Carlo Versano. Carlo, in the studio once again. Good morning. Hey, Wags. Welcome back. How you doing? I am good. Um, a lot of news to get to this morning. The FDA slapping a new warning on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because of an increased risk of a rare neurological disorder. It's known as Guillain-Barre syndrome. Regulators still say, though, the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risks. Data does not suggest a similar risk with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, according to the FDA. Meanwhile, Pfizer reps are going to be meeting with the government about a potential for booster shots. The U.S. saying, though, more data needed before it could be determined that boosters are necessary. In Israel, which has been about two months ahead of us, mm -hmm. uh, they have already started giving third Pfizer doses to some high risk adults. We're talking about um, people in nursing homes, um, people with chronic illness, uh, right. things like that. Like severely immunocompromised yes. uh, people, like heart transplants, that sort of thing. So I, yeah, I think that that, that day is probably coming soon here. Um, as for Johnson Johnson, I mean, you know, put a cork in it, right? It's this, this sucker is, uh, is done now, I think. I, I, it's, I sort of feel bad for the 12.8 million Americans who got this shot, my brother included, um, who must now feel like this thing was just rushed through given all of these new labels that they're putting on it. Um, but it is important to note that 12.8 million sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, but it's nothing compared to the 146 million people in America who got Pfizer and Moderna, which remain you know, the gold standards of these vaccines, right? Uh, later this week, millions of American families will receive the first of several no-strings-attached payments from the federal government. The Treasury Department will start sending monthly payments to most American families with children on Thursday, the beginning of the expansion of the child tax credit that was passed as part of President Biden's stimulus bill. The payments will cut child poverty by nearly half, according to experts. That is, if they reach the intended targets. Families that file taxes will get the money automatically, but millions of low-income families that don't file taxes are harder to reach. The White House has opened an online portal for those families to claim their money. If you need that link or if you know someone who might, it is in today's newsletter. Yeah, so these payments, Jill, uh, up to $300 per child per month. It basically works as like an advance against your eventual tax burden, right? If you file taxes, that is. Uh, it phases out if you earn $75,000 as a single filer or $150,000 as a married couple. Uh, and they will come starting on the 15th of this month, monthly, for a year. Beyond that, Congress would have to pass a law to make them permanent. That's something that the Democrats have been trying to do uh, and will continue to try to do. Um, the big issue, like you said, it, with this is the logistics, right? Federal government, not particularly good at this sort of thing. If you remember the healthcare.gov debacle of uh, the Obama administration. Um, the one thing that I don't uh, really understand is why they're not doing this through the Social Security Administration. That's the agency that knows how to reach people that don't have taxable income. Um, so they're not, they're doing that, this through the IRS instead. Um, so what's going to happen is those who get this money may not know why they're getting it or who to thank for it. I think that's one of the political risks here. In this case, it would be the Democratic Party who they would thank because every Republican uh, in Congress voted against this legislation. Uh, and Democrats have not done a particularly good job of messaging in terms of what this money is, why you're getting it, when you're getting it, uh, and how long it's good for. Um, but a huge deal, a huge part of the expansion of the social safety net in this country that we have not seen in a long time. Uh, let's turn to the turmoil in Latin America. President Biden voicing his support for the people of Cuba after thousands of Cubans took to the streets to protest a food and medicine shortage in one of the biggest demonstrations on the island in decades. Cuba's president has blamed the unrest on economic asphyxiation caused by the U.S. embargo, while Washington said it was the result of years of repressive one-party rule. A large police presence in Havana has put down whatever remained of the protests after the weekend. Dozens of activists have been detained, um, and they basically just shut off all social media in, in the country. 
and I think they, it's pretty hard to get on social media even before this, I think. Don't they basically like limit internet to uh, like a couple minutes a day or something in most of the... Yeah, um, I visited there a few years ago and it was, it was difficult even as a tourist to get online. Right. Um, you know, the Cuban embargo, I, I don't, why, why do we still have this? I don't really, I'm not quite sure. We started the embargo in the 60s uh, as a way to push back against, you know, the Soviet sphere of influence. Um, and we just sort of kept it in place even though the Soviet Union no longer exists and hasn't for a long time, Cuba not a th really a threat to the United States in any way, shape, or form. Um, you know, state sanctions like this I, often, I think, have the opposite of the intended effect. You've seen it in Cuba, you see it with Iran. You know, the idea is that you put the squeeze on these authoritarian governments so that hopefully you can sort of spark, what that does is, the hope is, that it sparks an organic uprising among the people, which obviously is better than going in militarily. But, but what often happens is that you just sort of consolidate government control and the people become too poor and too hungry really to, to rise up. Um, I, I think politically, with the reason why the Cuban embargo is still a thing is because Cuban Am Americans in South Florida, a very powerful voting bloc, one that Republicans need to keep and Democrats have always wanted to get. Um, I mentioned I was in Cuba about five and a half years mm. ago. When you were on vacation or you were doing, you were reporting? No, I actually went with B'nai B'rith, which is a Jewish organization, to, to visit the Jewish, com there's a very small Jewish community in right. Cuba. Um, and so it was kind of a, um, a humanitarian kind of mission where we, we would bring goods, medicines, um, even toilet paper, things like yeah, that, yeah. just you know, just kind of th these things that people need. There's this small Jewish population that basically fled the Nazis during the Holocaust, and then most fled <laughs> during the Cuban Revolution. Most went came to the United States, uh, but there is again this like small, small Jewish community that's there. Right. Um, so anyway, I, I, it was a fascinating time to be there because it was right when President, then President Obama was about to visit. Right. Um, we had just reestablished diplomatic relations with the country, um, lifting restrictions on travel and other things. And there was just this crazy sense of optimism and hope amongst the Cuban people. Uh, they were repaving streets, new businesses and restaurants had opened and the restaurants were great. Mm -hmm. um, and you just saw this, this kind of emergence of private businesses. Fast forward to now, it's it's a double whammy because yeah. President Trump basically reversed everything President Obama had done. Joe Biden le left Trump's policy in place. Um, and then you've got the pandemic, which has just exacerbated yeah. an already difficult situation where people wait online for hours uh, for basic food and necessities. But that said, uh, I mean, just to play devil's advocate, when you look back on whether a policy is successful, you know, I guess you need to take the long view. So while I agree these sanctions are really just hurting the Cuban people, uh, not just the government, some who had agreed with Trump have argued that by removing the sanctions and restoring diplomatic relations when the nation hadn't changed anything in terms of its right. leadership, you're basically just rewarding the bad behavior. Um, and now with these protests, which are historic, I guess we're seeing exactly what you said is the intended goal, which is you squeeze the governments to spark an organic uprising. Again, I'm playing devil's advocate yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. I don't really, I, again, I think you can't ever judge this stuff in real time sure. in terms of what's successful. It's like, you know, you've got to just play the long game. Uh, certainly something to keep an eye on. Where are we in, in a year from now, 10 years from now, and what sparked uh, whatever change could potentially come to Cuba? Yeah. And no question that the pandemic is really the thing here because, you know, Cuba relies on tourism money and there was, you know, it went to zero over the last year and a half. Right. Uh, meanwhile, in Haiti, the man suspected of playing a role in masterminding the assassination of the Haitian president, uh, Jovenel Moise, reportedly told a friend that he believed he was sent by God to take over the presidency. The mystery surrounding Christian Emmanuel Sanon and what exactly his role was in this whole thing continues to deepen. Other associates say they had no idea what he was up to. <laughs> you know, this whole story, I, I don't know what to make of it. There's more Florida links coming out, by the way. Several uh, of the men who were on this alleged hit squad were previous United States law enforcement informants. That's according to CNN today. Uh, several others were Colombian mercenaries uh, that were hired through a Florida-based security firm. Uh, so, again, I, I wish I had more insight to this. The, the whole thing is bizarre. Meanwhile, his... Uh, uh, 
Moise's widow, his wife, uh, speaking from her hospital room in Miami yesterday, just talking about how these guys came in guns blazing. They, you know, really they riddled his body with bullets. Um, so this was, you know, they were coming for him. There, there wasn't any sort of. They, they, there's these reports that, you know, they were trying to get rid of him and not kill him, but it certainly doesn't seem like that based on what she's saying. It just gets more and more bizarre um, yeah. as we hear about it. And just by the way, I want to make clear um, the B'nai B'rith, what I went, what I did in Cuba with B'nai B'rith, we came with goods that are, are available to all Cubans. Like they're not just for the Jewish community. We visited with, with elderly Jewish, the, yeah. the elderly Jewish community. And it, there's some, I, very few young Jews. I actually wrote uh, an article at the time called The Last Dinosaurs because it was like they're basically the Jewish community there is really dying out because anyone who's young has tried to leave the country. Sure. Um, but I just wanted to make that clear. Like we didn't just go and bring those goods for the Jewish community. They're they're available to everybody. Did you eat good Cuban food? I Cuban did. Food so the food good. was amazing. Um, yeah. And some of these new re and, and it's crazy because you see this you saw this really stark difference between the restaurants that were private restaurants and then the restaurants that were kind of run by the the government. Yeah. And it's like in the government ones, it's like rice and like <laughs> I mean it's like just like such basic right. you know food. And then when you go into these these private restaurants, um, they're phenomenal. You feel like you're in downtown Miami. And then you've got the, uh, you've got like the, the, the 50s cars driving around, right? Yeah. The whole thing is weird. It's, well, I mean, right, because they just can't get, yeah. they can't get new cars there. So I did the obligatory, you know, drive in like the old Cadillac or whatever, yeah. whatever the cars are, and you got the good video. And it's, it's a beautiful country, but it's just, it, it needs a, a lot of sure. economic help. Um, a historic drought in Brazil is about to make your mar morning coffee a lot more expensive. Prices for Arabica beans, which make up the bulk of Brazil's coffee crop, up 60% compared to last summer. In Brazil's agricultural region, uh, now is the time when the beans are harvested after soaking up rainfall over the summer months. But this year, the rain didn't show up, and an already poor crop is expected to yield even less. Another thing that's going to get more expensive, Jill, uh, other coffee rich countries also, it's not just Brazil, like, uh, you know, there's Colombia, Vietnam, they produce a lot of coffee. They've had much better harvest. They haven't dealt with this drought, uh, but they're dealing with something else, which is the shipping crunch that we've been talking about for months, right? They've got beans just sitting in ports trying to get out there. So the result is that the global coffee supply is coming in weak, just as global coffee demand rebounds out of the pandemic. People, coffee shops open, people getting more coffee, uh, just as they've been drinking more at home as well through COVID. Uh, so it's only a matter of time until this is uh, felt by consumers. And it's one of those things that basically everybody, I think, feels it, right? Everybody drinks coffee. Yeah, and it's just the the latest thing, as you say. Everything's right. more expensive. I, I went food shopping yesterday, and it was, I, you know, like, it was like a mini food shop. You know when you do, like, yeah. the mini ones? They're not the ones where you go with the whole <laughs> shopping list. You have a few items. And it was, uh, I think, like 85 bucks. You Those know, are the worst because it's always more than you think. If you're doing a big food shop, you're like, you know what? This is really going to hurt, but it's worth it because yeah. I'm getting a lot of, I'm getting food for the week. The worst is when you go to the grocery store and you're like, I'm just going to pick up dinner. And you're like, $100? What? Right. And I still have to do the big food shop yeah, later exactly. this week. Um, MLB All-Star Week might as well be called Shohei Yotani Week this year. The Angels' two-way hitter pitcher made his highly anticipated home run derby debut last night where he put on a clinic before getting ousted in the first round. Tonight, Otani will make history as the starting pitcher and lead-off hitter for the American League. Carlo, hard to overstate what an incredible season this guy is having. It is indeed, Jill. Um, it, you know, you've got a real-life Babe Ruth playing our national pastime right now, and a lot of people, it doesn't, no one really seems to care that much if you're not already a baseball fan, which I think is a shame because this tr guy is truly a one-of-a-kind. Uh, this He should be one of those people who sort of transcends the sport. He is that good. Uh, and he sort of is. I, there was a great piece in the LA Times this week talking about just how he has become this sort of like pop culture icon more than just a sports icon. And uh, the reporter interviewed his teammates uh, on the Angels who talk about how the team's bus, wherever, whenever they're going like to a game now or something, uh, it's now being trailed by this like sobbing teenager girls who are trying to get a, uh, a glimpse of Otani. So he's really sort of become this, you know, pop culture phenom. And by all accounts, he's also just a nice down to earth guy, uh, the kind of player that baseball needs more of as it really, you know, hemorrhages fans in the current era. 
Um, by the way, Pete Alonzo from the New York Mets won the home run derby. Um, and he uh, he actually won a million dollars. Like that's the that's the that's prize, the purse, yeah. which is more than his more than his salary. So that's actually uh, he's going to enjoy. Pretty that. cool. Yeah, yeah. There was there was there were there were reports last night about like all these players at the home run derby just sort of like lurking around trying to watch Otani. So he did good in the first round, but he did not make it very far. But tonight will be interesting to watch. All right, we're going to leave it there. That is what you need to know for Tuesday, July thirteenth. Have a good one, guys.